excited to have him with us. Uh, our food is catered by none other than Jerry and Angie Evans of Smoke and Jays. Uh, delicious food. So please, please, for your catering needs, feel free to reach out to them. Um, also want to give a quick shout out to our uh, venue, the Wilder Foundation. We truly appreciate them having us here. And thank you all for being here to support our 2019 cohort of the Josie R. Johnson Leadership Academy. Fellows had an incredible year this year. They did some amazing things as a full cohort um, in small groups out in communities. So we're excited to celebrate their, uh, their journey today. And we're excited to have you here to join us in celebrating them. Right now, we're gonna actually kick off into some reflections from all of our fellows. And first we have the Marika Reese. If you would join me at the front, please. And it was a um, really good experience, I'll stop rambling. Um, and being a part of the cohort taught me a lot about my personal leadership development. Um, so I started a business maybe three years ago, and it wasn't doing that good initially. And um, I was struggling in other areas of my life as far as like my leadership, but I always thought I was a good leader. I always knew I had the potential. Um, I just didn't know how to develop the skills I had. And um, I feel like with uh, the one-on-one -on -one meetings with Jesse as a coach, um, working with the cohort, uh, gaining all this knowledge, um, going to DC, I learned a lot about myself. And I mean, a lot of it has to do with just a lot of hard work I did. And some of it was the, co the cohort, but company went to the green, way in the green. And um, a lot of other good things have happened for me. Um, and I've taken on many more leadership positions um, in my life in general, and I will give some of the, a lot of that thanks to the cohort and Marcus and Ernest. Um, so moving forward, uh, I am going to take up a lot more space and a lot more rooms. I am, <laughs> I'm going to. Uh, you know, speak confidently, share my knowledge confidently. I'm going to take pride in the representation I bring into rooms and uh, do my best to share what I've learned and pass on to others and pay it forward in the way that I felt uh, the cohort and those that have come before me have done. So that's my call to action. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. All right, and next I'll have none other than the Mr. Kenneth Scales. Bowtie billionaire. Come on, Kenneth. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. He said I get the podium because I'm so tall up here, you know? So. <laughs> well, greetings and salutations, everyone. Uh, thank you all so much for coming out. Uh, to the best cohort uh, since ALF even started. Come on, 2019. <laughs> so um, six months ago, before I even knew about this fellowship, I um, actually never took a fellowship before. Um, a lot of times with my leadership, I've never really got any formalized training. Um, when I came in, I think our first uh, day that we all met, um, they said, what do you want to get out of the fellowship? And one of the things I said, 
was that a lot of times I feel like my cup is always pouring into somebody else. It's always pouring into anything that's not me. So I felt like there was a hole in my cup, right? And so I needed to take time to plug that hole so I could get filled. And honestly, through this whole process, my cup is filled and it's running over. Um, there's many different things um, within this cohort that I love. Like I love my cohort, my cohort mates. You know, I got 10 new friends, 11 new friends, you know? Um, the biggest thing was like when we went to DC, so I've never been to DC, or I've been to DC one other time, but just going to the African American uh, Museum and just seeing our history from, from where we started, from Africa all the way to where we are in present day. Uh, one big thing that I realized in DC was that um, there was a politician. Um, I talked about it before. Um, her name was Jal pa Jalila something. And I can't remember what area she represents, uh, but she was over education, uh, education committee. So I sat in the committee and uh, in the front row, and she's um, basically, she was a teacher of the year, like four years prior, and then she had two current teachers of the year. And there was a, a young lady that came in that's from the DC area, and said, you know what, I see that these uh, events happen all the time in my city, but I don't ever see any type of change. And so this young lady, she came with like a lot of animosity, a lot of uh, core hurts, a lot of hurt and pain. But that politician said, you know what, I started off in your shoes. I see myself where you are right now. She said, I grew up, I, now I never knew this lady, right? I never knew the politician. I never knew from face value that she uh, was a teen mom of two kids, dropped out of high school. Then she went to community college and then she went back to college. Different went to like a full four year, but then she somehow, some way made it through and now she's a representative. And so when I seen her story, it really inspired me because I know that I've been through a lot of stuff in my life as well. But at the same time, I didn't want to let the things that I was going through in my own life take control of what's going on for the future. And so with this cohort, or really, I mean, do really take a step back and allow me to think about what I want to do and what I want to accomplish. And so uh, moving forward, um, this cohort uh, also allowed me to build my confidence level, you know? I'm a very shy person. <laughs> that was a lie. <laughs> but um, I decided um, after this cohort, um, I decided to shoot my shot with another cohort um, after this. Um, it's called NLC, the New Leader Coalition. And so I'll be doing that as well. And then looking for, I'm not a politician, but you never know. And so I'm just keeping my options wide open. So vote for Kenna, not pay <laughs> Thank you, sir. In all my excitement, I forgot I was running a PowerPoint up here. Now look at this. All right, so before we go any further, I want to make sure everybody's clear on what we have coming for the agenda. Um, you just heard from a couple of our uh, fellows. After that, you'll hear from our Leadership Academy torchbearers. Following that, you'll also hear some words of wisdom from one of the uh, African American Leadership Forum co-chairs. And finally, you're here from our executive director, Mr. Marcus Owens. So I wanted to make sure everybody knew what to expect as we move forward with the agenda. But we'll continue with these reflections. So I will invite, hmm, yeah, which one of y'all is going to get it? Which one of y'all is going to get it? Um, yeah, Opal, it's time. It's time, Opal. I trust you. I know you can do it. <laughs> <laughs> you got it, you got it. <laughs> so good e uh, afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, it has really been a blessing to be a part of the Josie Johnson Leadership Academy, as well as the impact that uh, the African American Leadership Forum has played in my life. Um, I um, have been inspired by the coach that I received she was a powerful mentor. She pushed me beyond what I wanted to be pushed in so many different ways. Um, and when it comes to networking, unlike Kenneth, I really am a shy person. Um, I would prefer to be a part of the, the background as opposed to the forefront. However, I am learning to move in a different light. All right. <laughs> so, <laughs> So um, the experience at the uh, Congressional Black Caucus 
conference was, was a powerful experience. I, I can't even articulate. Um, it actually left me breathless. And so I will say that um, it has inspired me to, to um, want to go every year now and walk in the, uh, those hallways with those, those people who are movers and shakers. Um, so as I step into the next journey of this life, uh, last week when I was at school, an angel walked up to my desk and she said to me that she would provide an opportunity for me to develop as an author. And so, you know, that's, that's another uh, push that's, that's happening as a result of being a part of this fellowship. I really believe that. Uh, I will um, be sitting with a group of uh, uh, history makers. That's what I'm going to call them, history makers. We're going to make some, some history real soon as a result of this angel stepping up to my desk last week. Um, the one thing I really, really want to speak on is the village. The question was asked, what would we be doing to strengthen our collective? What should we be doing to strengthen our collective and uplift our community? Continuing the traditions of our ancestors, survive, live, and hope. This is a quote by Dr. Josie Johnson in her book. Hope in the Struggle is a powerful book um, that was written by she and um, some co-authors. Co she said, don't stop, keep on keeping on. And that's what we have to do. We have to keep on keeping on. We have to inspire one another to be great because we are great. And as a result of this experience, I want to say to each one of you, be your greatest, do your greatest, because Oprah was gonna be out there on the, in the forefront, on the corners, in the highways and the byways, doing her greatest. Thank you. <laughs> Next, I'm going to invite Joanna to come on up and share with the people. Take your time. Take your time. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, unlike my fellows, I had to write mine because I will talk a lot and not even get to the point. So mine is going to be written, and I'm just going to read from it if you all don't mind. Um, one of my mentors often recites this poem, and I believe it applies to this graduation and my fellow fellows. I, too, sing America. I am the darker brother. They send me to eat in the kitchen when company comes, but I laugh and eat well and grow strong. Tomorrow, I'll be at the table when company comes. Nobody will dare say, eat in the kitchen then. Besides, they'll see how beautiful I am and be ashamed. I too am America. Um, I say this point by Langston Hughes to give an example quickly of what this journey impacts and experience has done for me um, through the Dr. Josie R. Johnson Fellowship. When I was younger, I've always thought of myself as a leader and one who can implement change. And after all, if you know who my dad is, um, it just runs in the blood. Uh, once I graduated and entered into the workforce, I felt I began to slowly lose that confidence in leading. I often work in the background, making small changes here and there. Fast forward to now, I come out a better leader through a fellowship that invested in me. This fellowship saw in me what I thought was tiny and shined a light on how some of the mightiest and biggest change agents can often make change and make their mark behind the scenes. That in itself was powerful to me. I realized what I was doing could and would actually make change. By making change within my institution, it will inevitably invest in my own community. From here on out, I'll continue to strengthen my leadership muscle, allow God to use me and touch all of those I attend, I interact with, and ensure my community is seen and heard because I have the tools to uplift and invest in a community that has always uplifted and invested in me. One of the questions that Alf asked us was about the call to action. What should people in our network be doing to help strengthen our collective and a lift community. My answer to that is know your strengths, be humble, and acknowledge your weakness, and partner with people like my fellow fellows that fill in the gap of your weakness 
and vice versa. There's power in numbers. At no point should any of us walk past each other and not ask, how can I help? You were placed on this earth not to benefit yourself, but to help and benefit others. Through blessings, through wrestling others, you will in turn be blessed. My call to action, see your fellow, fellow brother and sister. Do not allow them to give up on themselves or others and invest in each other. I am thankful that I grew up in a community that Dr. Josie R. Johnson has had such an impact on the community. As I continue to lead, leaders such as Dr. Johnson will continue to be a guiding light. And I can only hope and pray that I am as effective in my community as she was. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And next we'll have Mr. Stevens. Come on up. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. I guess, first of all, I just want to thank the leaders uh, of, the, of, the ALF, uh, of the ALF organization, uh, Marcus, uh, Ernest, and man, I never will I ever uh, be able to pronounce your name, but <laughs> I see you all the time, and I believe it's Uzuma, is that correct? Oh, okay. Well, again, I appreciate all of you, and, and Dr. Josie Johnson, uh, obviously, uh, she had a great impact on all of us in this room. Uh, some of the things that she did uh, have allowed us to be in this space, and then and many just like her. And, and I, when I think about the, the cohort, for me, uh, you know, some of the things that I've come through, uh, I always uh, challenge myself, uh, are, are we going to have a brighter future as, as, as a community? But when I look at the young individuals uh, that I had an opportunity to meet in the cohort, I truly believe that our future is in good hands. And I really just want to give uh, all those young individuals that I had an opportunity uh, to participate in the cohort a hand. And, and for me, I think my next step, uh, the work that I do, uh, I have a, a great opportunity uh, to work with young people and uh, have young people facing the challenge of, of dealing with life uh, like a monopoly game and only being able to have one dice. Uh, when they go around gold, they don't collect $200. Uh, when they go around gold, they owe money and, and, and they have different issues that they have to deal with. And the one thing that I, that I have found with being a part of the cohort that they can overcome. You know, there are things that we can do uh, as a community to put in place for them uh, to be able to do things that we thought that we could never do. And so uh, as, as I move forward, uh, my biggest challenge is gonna be able to find spaces uh, to have tough conversations with employers about looking at transportation and housing is just like they would health benefits, uh, going into other spaces and having conversations with police officers and instead of uh, keeping a tick, sheet, a tick sheet of how many arrests they, they make, maybe do a new report and say that they visited with some young people and they had a great conversation with them. I would love to see police reports reflect the positive things uh, that police officers do. Because for me, when I look at the whole system, it starts with an arrest. And so if anything that we can do uh, to have a conversation with police officers about, man, just pausing, and seeing if does this really require me taking this young man down here and getting him caught up in the system. Because simply the system doesn't know the difference between an arrest and a conviction, unfortunately. And so until we can get into that space and start having conversations with them to make them better stewards and have better discernment, because it's not just a passing thing. You know, those things that happen on those street corners and those police officers doing the things that they do, they affect us all. And I was affected by it. But because I had uh, mentors in my life, I was able to overcome it. And just having a, a, a cohort like this, again, it makes you mindful and it makes you want to be a good steward of the opportunities uh, uh, that you get. And so my call for action is for all of us. Uh, just uh, like I alluded to earlier, start having those conversations, start having those things that appear to be unusual and those things that we think that we can't do in the change because I can truly say the young people that was in this cohort, you know, they're going to be there to hold that torch if it's something that can move the community forward. And I just want to thank you all for your time. All right, all right. And Mr. Robert Harper. 
you wouldn't mind joining me. Everything designer, that's on me. <laughs> <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Robert Harper. I am honored to be here and to say that I am an ALF, um, J-R-J-L-A alum. <laughs> um, a whole lot of letters in that acronym. Um, earlier this week, a lot of you know, I was I became the first person in my family to obtain a master's degree. Um, Woo! Thank you, thank you. Thank you. A whole lot of hard work, um, but so I say that to say that I think this this uh, fellowship for me came at a perfect time, um, a, a time of transition, a time of reflection, um, kind of looking back on my young career at, to this point and trying to figure out what that next step is going to be, where am I going to move to, and where am I going to be able to make the most impact. Um, and so when I think about what the Josie R. Johnson Fellowship was for me, I think. Um, it was a, a, a symbol of, of hope, kind of, because you're, you're always, every day we go to work and we're, we're just going through the motions. You, you're always questioning, am I doing the right thing? But this fellowship shows you a symbol of saying, okay, well, we actually were making an impact. There was a need for the work that we were doing. Um, so when we went to DC, uh, we got to sit down and talk to each other and figure out what, what each other are doing. You start to feel guilty once you find out that there's a lot of people in our community, black people, that are doing a lot of good work. Um, that we didn't know about. Um, so coming from undergrad where I studied sociology, I'm thinking about um, sociologists like W.E.B. Du Bois. Once I started to learn more about what he was doing, you start to again feel guilty and say, there's a lot of, that's a strong leader in the black community that I didn't know about. And so you, so you think about uh, Josie Johnson, a lot of the work that she did. I'm just now recently learning about the history of racial covenants and redlining that happened in the Twin Cities. Um, and so as you navigate these majority white spaces, um, you might be misled to think that black people are placing themselves in these unfortunate circumstances. Um, and so one of my call to, to action for you all is to do a little more research and figure out why um, a lot of the, the uh, disparities that are existing economically, socioeconomically, uh, why they exist and how can you um, change them. Um, one of the ways that I've been trying to really change them over the past six years is through mentorship. And so I'm a PAGE scholar. I've uh, been a PAGE scholar for seven years. Um, and so I have, I have a few of my mentees here. Glad that, that y'all can make it. Um, I try and make sure that I just give them a little bit of time, you know, every other Saturday um, to, to listen to anything that they want to talk about. Um, I was able to bring Brett to my racial inequality and public policy class last year. And I think that was really powerful for him to sit there and see a black professor teaching a master's course on racial inequality and public policy. Yeah. Um, and as I sat there and looked at Brett looking at Dr. Myers, I had to think back, when was the last time I had a black teacher? And that was all the way back in kindergarten when Mr. Porter was telling me, he was the first person to tell me that I was gonna be somebody. And so um, I think all of that relates to the, the, the purpose of this fellowship finding black excellence and lifting it up. Um, and all of us are at a different point in our career. So that is, that's kind of the beauty of it. We're all like, okay, well, where are you at in your life? Um, Stevenson, where are you at? You know, what are you doing with Ujamaa? Or maybe how can I help that cause? Um, finding, out about, about, finding out about a lot of the great work that Leslie's doing with the NAACP. Um, you know, don't complain, activate. Yes. And, so, <laughs> and so I try and, uh, I try and, Take it my, make it my job to learn a little bit about what everybody in our cohort is doing. And like, like everyone has said, um, I consider all of y'all family now. Um, and so I look forward to uh, continuing to do this great work. Um, keep in touch. Yes. All right. Up next, we have none other than Miss Leslie Redman. Come on down.
Zora Neale Hurston taught us that. I like to say if we simply complain about our oppression, they will still kill us and say we enjoyed it. So don't complain, activate. Grace and peace, everyone. Again, my name is Leslie Redman. I have the honor and privilege of serving as the president for the Minneapolis NAACP, also known as the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. I am a first-generation college graduate. I came to Minnesota to study my law degree at the University of St. Thomas. I recently received a JD MBA from St. Thomas and passed my bar examination. Thank you so much. And I was actually studying for the bar as I had the pleasure of being a participant and a fellow for the African American Leadership Conference. And it was super helpful to have those opportunities to be reflective and to think about my leadership, to have an opportunity to bond with people who look like me, who are also activating the community, was phenomenal because I'm from the inner city of Washington, DC. And I'm not used to ever being in rooms where I'm the only one. But St. Thomas put me back in that situation, but I was smart enough to know that I'm not the only one and that there are people in the community, like my brother Rob said, that are activating. And so this was a great opportunity to meet people like Marika and so many other people who I never had the opportunity to know. And so for me, I'm taking away from this opportunity a network of brothers and sisters who are phenomenal. I'm taking away being more reflective and insightful. The importance of not being a wounded soldier on the battlefield because so often we are pouring our all into the community and really pouring things into ourselves. So there were many days where I was like, uh, I gotta go to Alpha Man. I really need to be studying for the bar. But it was great because I felt so rejuvenated and energized after. And it gave me the momentum I needed to go back to the library and study. And so it just reminded me to always pour into yourself. There's always time to take care of yourself. And I'm really excited about that. And so I did actually apply for the Bush Fellowship and I'm on to the second round. So you all keep me in your prayers. <laughs> me in your prayers because that will be how I'm continuing to make sure that I'm pouring into myself and that I'm not just ripping and running, ripping and running, ripping and running. And I am just so thankful for each and every one of you all. As I look out into the audience, um, I really don't see strangers. I see family. Um, and that's really um, important for me because all of my family, they're still in D.C. The takeaway that I would like to propose to you all most of you already know, it's going to be don't complain, activate, right? And with DCA, there are three C's of activation, communication, collaboration, and compassion. And when God first gave me those three C's, I was thinking it was about externally, you know, making sure the NAACP was communicating, collaborating, and being compassionate. But what I realized was even more important was that I was communicating internally, recognizing when I was okay and not okay. You know, I would urge you all to do that. It's okay for black people to go to therapy. We know that God is always on our side, amen? But you know, we might need some extra assistance. I'm collaborating, you know? Anika is my birthday twin. We were born the same day, March 29th, 1992. That's like my born sister. And we collaborate constantly. There are days where I need to call her and just cry. And that's okay, right? And then make sure that you're being compassionate, not just externally, but being compassionate towards yourself because everything that we reflect externally is just a reflection of what's going on on the inside, right? And so don't complain, activate, communicate, collaborate, and be compassionate. Grace and peace, everyone. <laughs> Right. Now we'll invite Leslie's birthday twin. <laughs> join us at the front, please. Come on up. Hey, everyone. Hey. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Like Ernest has said, my name is Anika Bowie. I'm one of the Josie Johnson Fellows, and it's such an honor um, to have this opportunity and so quickly get to this point of graduation. I just want to thank you, Ernest. I want to thank you, Marcus, and so many of the, our, our torchbearers who were there helping us along the way. Uh, when I initially uh, began, I had the intention of really taking off my cape and really getting fed. Um, 
um, and developed and taking the opportunity really to learn how I can grow as a leader. Um, and it was kind of an oxymoron experience because during that time I was a candidate for St. Paul City Council Award One. So I was, yeah. thank you. So I was going through an election cycle where you have to be on the tip top of your game and always be that person to have all the answers. Um, so it was just such a, a experience to be able to learn from so many other folks who, um, you know, my sister Marika, who was hitting heavy on the mental health piece, reminding us that we need to step into this industry, not only um, as a business uh, model, but as a liberation for our folks. And the quote that really sits hard, hard um, heavy on my heart is um, Toni Morrison's, the function of freedom is to free someone else. And what I've got from this experience is that freedom of not being told that I have to be my top self, be a strive for excellence in a way to where you always have to show up with that mask, always have to show up with that you know, 100% of giving your all, but you can be in the comfort of a support group of collaboration. You can be in a support group of compassion. You can be in a support group of leadership and knowing that we're at an age and at a time in our lives that we still have so much growth to look forward to. So that was amazing. Going to the Congressional Black Caucus, was phenomenal. That was my first time and many of the fellows first time. And I'm um, seeing just very powerful elected officials, congresswomen and men, uh, black congresswomen and men, you know, really walking in their pathway and letting their, uh, some of their, their adversities be the reason why they're paving forward um, a pathway for many of us to walk into. So what my call of action is today, um, as someone who is the vice president for the Minneapolis NAACP, I always urge us to be an advocate for whatever, for whatever you feel like is necessary in terms of the advancement of our people. Um, I always is going to call the action for us to be engaged in the elections every single year. We know this year there's a presidential uh, campaign or excuse me, election, but we have so many phenomenal people, especially our torchbearers right here in the room, who are running, uh, like Shaniqua Johnson, who was a fellow who's running, myself who had ran, and that we need to build into that. And uh, showing up, door knocking, donating to these candidates. Even your issues that you may see that that candidate or that elected official is having a blind spot to, let's not you know, be crazy with our cousins. Let's love our cousins and hold them accountable with love and support them with those issues and educating them on those issues that we all have blind spots to. So also my call to action and um, uh, a little leak for y'all, I um, have approved, or excuse me, uh, confirmed to uh, work on Elizabeth Warren's campaign as the director, uh, the regional director of organizers. And, you know, I'm not here to endorse Elizabeth Warren, but one thing I would say, um, reading her story, she was a lawyer and she was a woman who really was the first of many um, in her lifetime. And she had a strong perseverance to keep going, especially stepping into politics in a very male-dominated space. And then even being bold enough to like speak on the issues and speak um, against all the adversity, speak against all of the, uh, the what they expect you to be as a woman and to stand firm into that. She also is really strong on um, student loans and making sure students have what they need to be successful so when they graduate, we're not being held down by high levels of debt. Now we know what coming with leadership also comes a lot of degrees and expectations for us to pay them off. And uh, myself included, I want to make sure that we have a president and a leadership that is, you know, not telling us that we have to pay a fine or pay a black tax, you know, for us to be successful or for us to be in a position of power or authority, that we are able to be economically strong, 
we are able to be mentally strong and we're able to connect and have a network for folks to support us in you know, this liberation journey that we're, that we're all on. So again, I uh, wanna say thank you and I'll leave you with my favorite quote from Harriet Tubman, freedom is not given, it is won. And what we're winning here right now is leadership and it's power and it's authority and it's also community. So thank you. Right, so we actually have two additional fellows who couldn't be with us uh, today. One uh, is uh, Monica Fabia. Um, I just want to congratulate her on an amazing time uh, participating in the cohort. Unfortunately, today um, she's in Greater Minnesota, had to visit, visit a relative who, who may be passing soon. So um, certainly sending up prayers for her and hoping for the best for her and her family. Um, also, on a brighter note, another fellow, Shaniqua Johnson, uh, earned a new position that took her out to Washington, D.C., so she has a new career that's going to keep her out there on Capitol Hill. So we're excited for her and want to congratulate her. She actually sent along a video to share, so I'll go ahead and play this for you all now. Hello, hello everyone. Thank you so much for coming out tonight to support the Dr. Yoshi R. Johnson Leadership Society Fellows. I wanted to take the time, I'd let everybody know, and some of you do know, that I am in Washington, D.C. I'm serving as one of some of the assistants for the Transportation and Infrastructure Association Subcommittee. I am a little bit of a mouthful, I'm so getting used to saying it. Uh, anyways, I am so sad that I could not be there to support you all tonight. But as you know, the holidays are coming up, and I have to see some graduation and some discussions with my family. And you know, my mom had to go on that one. Uh, nonetheless, I took the time to do this video because I want to take a second, go three minutes, <laughs> to tell you just how this experience has impacted me as a young professional, a black man, and meditation. When I started at the Spokane Drop and Leadership Academy, I was I came in not with the Quite a few of my fellow cohort members and I knew each other, but I didn't have a chance to get to know each other. I was very optimistic and very excited to be a part of a safe, black, and cohort member that was very excited and I was really proud of that. Over the last six months, this cohort has changed my life of self-awareness and confidence and my own personal and professional capability, open doors and allotted spaces for networking both in the and provided with the support to these families that had my dad. And for someone who just moved halfway across the country, having support base back home means the world to me. This is a new journey that I'm embarking on. One that I am sure will have its blessings, perks, and challenges. As some of you may know, I was born and raised in Minnesota. Washington, D.C. is a whole different ballgame. Not just beyond the snow or the weather, you can honestly see that, but also just in general. So you guys are like a small fish in a big pond. I see it as a fresh start, though. Uh, for this next year, I'm really going to be intentional about ensuring that I put God, my family, and me first. My year for 2020 is a new year of um, capital experience, recording my vision and making a plan. If things without work is dead, then work without meaning has to be misled. Mm -hmm. I moved to DC to get my job to time to really start exploring opportunities for me with others, without others' input, opinions of where I should have gone, where I should be, how long I should be there. I guess you can say I intentionally took back my time. Speaking of which, I've decided to make two hard asks. One for my cohort and one for the audience out there today. For the first one, Opal, Monica, Stevenson, Alicia, Kenneth, Robert, Anika, Leslie, and Joanna, please, please stay in touch with me. And please stay in touch with one another. I know that this was quite a ride, but I can't tell you how many times I've been a part of cohorts and just fall apart the minute we are obligated to one another. Let us not be our who knows where we're going to end up? We may have a piece of job in the air, we may get it, grab the gun among us, <laughs> calm down, calm down, don't talk about me. Thank you for the pain. I hope you all have got your back as well. If you want to be here and go home with me, we will 
will definitely have to engage in action for I am not in my room. Do you? For the people that still remain in their thought of, there are black people you don't know. There are black people that actually walk by each and every day. And like, we know that is a Minnesota practice. Mm -hmm. I want to know what that is. Each and every day, our folks negotiate, we favor for one another, we have a job because they're not going to meet someone, we meet someone else, and all of those people don't look like If we want to uplift our community, it starts with us first. When I was dealing with repeated barrier after barrier, Kenneth was the one who asked me on the call. When I was there, he introduced me and was like, I literally had nowhere to go, I called him a research, and he was a I say that to say, when I needed my community, my community needed my help. And it's too often I don't think that's the case for a lot of black people in our community in Minnesota. When I wanted to go to happy hour with Rob, he stood me up. I'm just kidding. <laughs> 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 in many ways, they had my back. But we need to have one another. I know that was a little difficult to hear. Thank you for bearing with us. And I'm glad we got a chance to hear from Shaniqua today. Uh, next, I want to invite a couple folks who have been really supportive to the Josie R. Johnson Leadership Academy journey for our 2019 cohort. These are a couple of our torchbearers. So these are folks in community who are more established in their leadership, who have committed to supporting the fellows throughout their journey while they're participating in the program. So if I could have the Devon Pittman and Mr. Justin Terrell join me. Good evening, good evening, everyone. I'm actually coming to you um, not only as a torchbearer, but also as an inaugural fellow of the Josie R. Johnson Leaders Fellowship. Right. The very best, <laughs> Kenneth. Um, I am really, really honored to be here today and to see all of you. I know that the fellowship has evolved in an incredible way, and so I'm also excited to see that too. Um, the type of folks that come through the fellowship are already leaders. And we know that um, when I started as a fellow, I already had my bachelor's degree. I already had my master's degree. I had already started three businesses but there was something still missing. And that was that piece where I didn't have connections with leaders, I didn't have the right mentors in my life, and I needed people who would speak life into me and people who would encourage me to reach for the stars. Um, and so, as a torchbearer, I would like to say to all of you who are graduating today to step out on faith. Don't be afraid to do whatever it is that you know that you are called to do. The only thing that you have to fear is fear itself. I read a book um, titled The Alchemist, and I'm sure a lot of you in this room read the book. My uh, banker actually referred the book to me. He said, Devonna, you have to read this book. And I don't know if you felt what I felt when I was reading the book. I was like, okay, let's get to it. What's gonna happen? What's happening? What's going on in this book? And at the end, so the, the whole premise of the book is that he kept having these dreams that a treasure awaited him, but he needed to go on this long journey in order to find that treasure. And what he found was that when you want something, the universe conspires with you to get it. And sometimes we take these long journeys, long unnecessary journeys to get where we're going, and we're already there. We already have exactly what we need to be successful. So one of the final things that I will say before I let my mic share 
<laughs> get his turn, is um, that some of us work in these organizations and we haven't yet utilized our voices. Here in Minnesota, we have some of the worst disparities in the country, and that's not okay. We have to start using our voices and hold our, our leaders accountable, even in some of the practices, the inequities that we see every day in our work. The employment inequities, the, um, uh, the way we see protocols and policies being passed on in our companies, we have to speak up as leaders and now torchbearers because you are you will always be a fellow but um you will be torchbearers because you can't just leave the fellowship and not be a torchbearer right. i know that i have not had an opportunity to do one-on-ones with all the fellows and um it's not too late i'm available you guys have my phone number if you don't please find it and reach out to me i will make time my name again is Devonna Pittman and I am running for Hennepin County Commissioner of District 1. I need y'all support, but I'm never going to be too busy for you all. So please reach out to me and I would love to have a conversation with you all. I need your help. Brooklyn Park, Brooklyn Center, New Hope, Robinsdale, Osseo, Crystal. The caucus is February 25th and I need to activate my entire network and some. So please, 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 let's let's do this. Let's get this 27-year incumbent out that hot seat. Good afternoon. Um, Good afternoon. <clears throat> so I was also going to talk about the album. This is mine. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Justin Terrell. I'm the executive director of the Council for Minnesotans of African Heritage. I am very excited to be uh, part of this conversation today. So I want to thank Ernest and Marcus for inviting me to be a torchbearer. Um, I've been involved with Alf since, you know, the days of Trista, Trista Harris and Chris Stewart. And, and I've watched this organization grow and uh, develop. And it has a really important spot because we are always talking about the fact that we have some of the worst racial disparities in the state. I mean, in the nation, but some of the best solutions are in this room, mm. are in this program. And I think, and I'm just here, frankly, to agitate a little bit because we've been admiring problems for a long time. Amen. And now that, and I, as an organizer, I had a little bit of a, I had I, what I thought was like I was behind the veil. You know, I could like call legislators and say stuff, you know, that you normally wouldn't say to a legislator. Mm. As the executive director of the council, I got a front row seat to the biggest mess that you have ever seen in your life. They have no solutions for us. They hear me. They have no policy solutions for the problems we face in this state. They don't have it. We do. And if we don't continue to foster these type of programs, these type of focus on our own leadership and our community, and start to see each other, because that is also real, what Shaniqua was talking about. Like, we're gonna be stuck in this situation for a very long time, because there's just too many people who benefit from our pain. Y'all with me on that? All right. All right. So I texted Marcus, I mean, I texted er Ernest earlier today, and I said, what do you need me to talk about? Um, and I'll keep my remarks short. And he said, mentoring. And I thought about the folks on the screen, and I looked around, I said, man, I ain't nobody's mentor in this room. <clears throat> the folks in this room, you got your own body of work. I work with Leslie what feels like all the time. We don't even talk that often, but I feel like I'm always working with Leslie. I know that the sister's over there grinding at the AG's office. I know she's grinding at the NAACP, and I'm so thankful for the work of the folks in this fellowship. So, it's, uh, so and I will say I do mentor a young man who I have to pick up from North Dakota in the morning and drive back and have one of those awesome conversations uh, about you know the fact that he's leaving college and he just got there, right? And I do think it's worth saying that some of our job in this state as, as a people and as leaders is living in that tension between your best hopes for someone and their worst decisions. <laughs> I'm, oh, I'm the only one? <laughs> Come on. But it's also you get to you also know that with those worst decisions, as long as there's air in our lungs, right? 
for better or for worse, we can always go, we can always turn things around. And that's why when people from outside the state, outside of, the, outside of Minnesota ask me, Justin, why Minnesota? I always tell them because things are possible here that ain't possible nowhere. Mm -hmm. We can go from last or fourth, right, <laughs> to first. That is possible here. And I think that the black folks in this state, and I, you know, I represent every last one of y'all, but I try not to speak for y'all because I'm clear that strong people don't need a strong leader, right? Dr. Rose Brewer continues to teach me that. That I'm here to make sure you have a vehicle so you can speak for yourself with the folks that need to hear. But I will say that, but I will say though, um, uh, that was a tangent. I like lost my point. <laughs> but but I will say though, you know that the folks in this the folks in this room can be a part of the story of how Minnesota went from last to first. And then I'll just start. I just want to share a little bit about being a torch bearer. Is that cool? Cool. Because I'm not. I don't consider myself a mentor to the folks in this room. But I will say I am a torch bearer, and I'll break I'll break it down why. So. So I grew up in South Minneapolis. You know, my family was homeless. We moved up here from Cleveland when I was a kid. I'm sure folks have heard my story, so I don't need to get into details, but, um, and we struggled. I went to social work to try to help folks, just families just like mine. And then once I got to the point where uh, some of the youth I'd work with started showing up in adult services, and I started realizing that, you know, DeAndre may be a knucklehead. Let's just be honest, DeAndre is a knucklehead but he don't belong in the adult homeless group system, right? Mm -hmm. We can work with that kid. We can get that kid in somewhere else. And when I tried to do that and system started to tell me, Justin, your biggest problem is you believe you can change things. Mm -hmm. I said, dear Lord. Mm -hmm. First, like you got the wrong one, right? Okay. Change is always something I've always dedicated myself to. And I, and, and I think there's a track record there. But I knew I had to start taking on systems. So that's how I got into organizing. That's how I got into the role that I'm in now. And, and I will tell you that um, the reason why I'm considering myself a torch bearer is because I cannot wait to hand off this torch. <laughs> <laughs> it ain't no secret. We've had great leaders at the council, but when I got to the council, and one of them, I think Narita's here somewhere, the chair of my board is here. You know, the council was in trouble. It's been in trouble. Why am I even bringing this up? Because we have to protect black institutions in our Talk state. We can't have, we, we can't change and address any of the issues we, we're dealing with if we, can't, if we can't protect our institutions. The NAACP was, the NAACP was banned for life at one point. We had to get that out of mothballs. Alf has had its struggles and now it's functioning and operating. The council is moving in the right direction. Everyone wants to talk about how we lost now. Yeah, we, nothing, we lost nothing. Hmm. Everything we need to move forward is in this room right now. All right. Mm -hmm. And so I just wanna encourage you, protect, your, protect our black institutions, support each other, protect and support our black leaders. There's six black legislators at the Capitol and we always talk about holding them accountable and I believe we should. The reality is we also need to show up with any of this. That's very true. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Every politician, and I'll say this a little bit of lobbyist advice, and I'll sit down. You know, every politician cares about one thing. They know how to count. They count votes, and they count money, right? Black folks, we have a big disparity in voting, and we don't give big checks. And so showing up is the best way to support our black, our black agenda at the Capitol. So I invite you to show up. Our annual meeting is on the, 20, on the January 14th at North Point. Hey, Stella, thanks for hosting us. Um, and our day on the hill is February 26th. So I'll just, I'll close with this final, I, would, I was gonna hit you with the alchemist verse, the, you know, when you, when you uh, are walking in your purpose, the universe conspires for your success. We know this to be true. And so I'll just remind you all that, um, that the best solutions to the problems in our state are in this room. And I'm honored to be here and to be considered a torch bearer. And when you're ready to come grab this torch at the council, just let me know. You can have it because we need to we need someone to be there and be stable, and then we need to keep expanding and growing our black institutions, black businesses, and black leadership across the state. Thank you for the time.
man, y'all make my job so easy. <laughs> make my job easy, man. My heart is full. Um, the the fact that I had the opportunity to create space for this cohort to come together with a group of people who were established in leadership and committed to supporting their journey, and then create spaces for that group to learn together, grow together, and build relationships with one another, just called to light for me the importance of that work, but also helped me to realize that it, it just happens. Like, it, it just happens. All we gotta do is create the space and be willing to invest the time and energy, right? And that's where our elevation, our collective elevation comes from. Yeah. So thank you all once again for being here and being committed to this work. Next, I'm going to invite one of our co-chairs for the African American Leadership Forum to the podium, the Miss Stella Whitney West. <laughs> Well, um, first of all, thank you to all of you for being here. And these, um, Ernest told me that I'm to get words of wisdom, but I feel like I've gotten words of wisdom from all of you. Um, those of you who have spoken words of wisdom and those of you who are here representing um, words of wisdom in the space that you occupy. And then I have to say to my uh, granddaughter, Camille, Nicole, sitting over there who came with me. And uh, she kept saying, well, uh, Gina, she said, well, when are you speaking? When are you speaking? I said, well, after reflections and after everybody else. And she's like, oh, OK. So then after a while, she said, OK, are you up now? And I said, yeah, I'm up now. So then she, I see that, oh, no, she still didn't put down the phone. She's texting her brother. So mm. <laughs> she wasn't that concerned about it. But hey, that is my ride or die. My, my favorite grandchild named Camille, because she's always trying to get me to, because she has two siblings, and she's always that. She's the youngest. Well, who's your favorite? I said, you're my favorite grandchild named Camille. <laughs> well, what if mom had another child and her name was Camille? But you will always be my favorite grandchild named Camille Nicole. So, <laughs> always my favorite. So, what I, a couple of things that I want to say. Um, first of all, uh, Devon, where, where does she go? Did she just leave? Yes. I'm telling y'all, if you live in her district in Hennepin County, vote. If you don't live there, you know folk that live there, vote. Even if you don't know folk that live there, go there. Pass out some literature, support, because we need her, right? Yes. Hennepin County, I live, born and raised, Ramsey County, Rondo neighborhood, right. I'm working in Hennepin County forever. Lots of money. Lots of money. Two billion dollars is one of the largest counties in the country. And it took 166 years before this county got any kind of representation of us. Just this year, two commissioners of color, two women. Right? There's only seven county commissioners. How do I know this? Because I'm always up talking about counting the votes, looking for where my four votes. Mm -hmm. And it's such a pleasure, such a joy to know that. Oh, there's two right there. I don't have to, I just gotta get two more. If I get divided, we get divided. <laughs> One more, all right? So we, we've got to do that. Um, I also want to say, because I heard somebody else say that, uh, that they are graduate of St. Thomas, so I got my MBA from St. Thomas. Right. Somebody else said that they were a Bush Fellow, thinking about the fellowships, or I, I think it was you, Leslie, you're right? Yeah. I'm a Bush Fellow. Ooh. Keep going for it. And if they say, you know, well, you didn't make it the first time, keep going, keep applying. I know so many people who maybe didn't make it the first time, second time, continue, you will get in. 
So, I'm gonna say you only got five minutes. All right. <laughs> One thing I want to tell you to do because we many of us just came back from California from an awesome yeah. kind of like what was that? An awakening. A, Tree, knowledge, all kinds of things. We had healthy food. We were out in the redwoods of California. It was 65 degrees. It was raining when y'all had snow, but we bring, we're going to bring you something back. So one of the sessions that I went to was called The Soul of Money. And I'm going to tell you to get this woman's book. Her name is Lynn Twist. Has anybody read that book? Read that book book because if you want to understand what has been happening to us from day one it is all about money and if you don't understand the history of money in on this planet in this world um, we've been missing a lot so put that on your to-do list and one of the things that she talked about was the lies in the truth. So one of the lies in this world is the lie of scarcity, right? That there's always, there's not enough, right? There's not, the pie is not big enough. The lie of scarcity, that's a lie. There is enough. And the truth is that there is enough sufficiency. And when she laid that out, I'm like, Sure, you're right. That's not right. Because when you get people to buy into the lie of scarcity, what do they do? Right? This is for me and mine, not you and I. And when I got that, I'm like, that's it. Class is over. <laughs> Ready. But what I want to tell you is that you all are enough. Mm. Believe that. It was the hardest lesson that I had to learn because I always felt like I wasn't enough. There was something missing. Know this, that you are enough. You are smart enough. You are good looking enough. You are educated enough. You are black enough, right? You are enough. And remember that when you are called to serve in leadership, and you all are leaders, understand that leadership can happen anywhere. It can be in the front of the room, in the back of the room, and alongside, right? Understand that leadership can be quiet. It can be loud. Right? And it's not a position that is not leadership. Always remember that. You are enough. And when God calls, doesn't always call the qualified, but he qualifies those who he calls. You are enough. Thank you. Next, we're going to have some words from our executive director, Mr. Marcus Owens. My God, this is beautiful. First, before I even get started, just one more round of applause for our graduating class of 2019. amazing leaders, but I want you to know that there's other amazing leaders that have been caring for you this entire time. So quick shout outs. I've got my board co-chair with me, Stella Whitney West here. I've got the staff of the ALF, of the African American, the ALF, I like to call it the ALF, <laughs> the African American Leadership Forum, uh, LaCora, Alyssa, uh, Ernest, and then we're missing Rebecca. She's not with us right now, but we, we're, we're happy to be here. And then um, we have alum from the Josie R. Johnson Leadership Academy. Those that are alum, please raise your hand so people can see you. Look at that. And I, I wanna give an acknowledgement to Dr. Josie Johnson that could not be with us today. Um, she's the reason why we're all here. 
for many reasons, but particularly for this this academy, this this uh, experience for leaders in our community. So I want to give her honor. So this is the the fifth annual academy, and uh, this is the first year that I've got to you know really help and develop this program in partnership with Ernest here, and we really just thought about what is this academy really about. And for us, as we started to talk about it, it's for many things, but for the most part, it's a, a vehicle for our community's emerging leaders. It's a place for us to be in community together. Many times we're off on our own, and I've heard several uh, comments about this, but you feel like you're the only one. You feel like you're the only one. And you're trying, you're pushing, and you're striving, and you don't feel like you're enough at times because you feel like you're alone. This cohort is about being together. It's about creating a, a community of other leaders so that you can feed each other as well as feed everyone else on the outside. It, it's really about bringing you all together to care about what's happening in our community. You know, I'm from Minneapolis, I'm from the north side, but without the connection to what was happening over here in St. Paul, what's happening in Brooklyn Park or Woodbury or anywhere else that we are at in the state, because I'll tell you something, being in this role for over a year and a half, I can tell you we're everywhere, but sometimes we don't feel like we're nowhere, right? So getting those connections to community really matters. Um, but then there's this connection and proximity to each other. So as you start to build community, you start to weave together and you start to find out there's torchbearers and there's others that have been in your shoes before, you start to get confidence. You start to feel like you're being filled. Your cup is being filled, right? So we wanna make sure that comes out in this, this uh, academy. But one of the other things that we think about as a leader is development of your skills. And as we talked about the development of skills, this is an ongoing and fluid thing. It doesn't end once you finish a class or you get a certificate or whatever, a, a graduate degree, whatever it is, but there's skills that, that really matter in our community and we wanted to highlight those in this um, cohort this year and that was around communication. If you can communicate as a leader and you can say the same thing five different times, now you can start to get through to people because people need to hear and see things in different ways from you as a leader. Um, critical thinking. There are a lot of problems in our community that we, we talk about all the time, but we can't allow those problems to be the guest of honor in our, in our world. So critical thinking allows you to say, okay, that's the problem, great. What are all the elements of that problem? What are the solutions? Who are the people? What are the resources? Critical thinking allows you to visualize what you actually want to accomplish and what you actually want to solve for it. Um, and then the third one is conflict management. You know, it, it seems simple, but when you're face to face with another person that's not you, conflict will exist at some point in time. But it's your job to have the emotional intelligence and the skills to be able to handle that conflict and turn it into something that's fluid that you can work together with that other person or that group. There's so much conflict in our community at times, and we just don't necessarily have the skills to figure out, you know what, let's bring the emotions down and let's see each other eye to eye as a person. Um, my little my little thing came out, but um, you know we, we thought about all these elements, and you can see it here today. Um, these fellows have gone through different excursions where we brought them through the NAS tour. Thanks, uh, Kenneth, for that. We brought them over here to Halle Q. Brown and learned from uh, the folks there. We have taken them out to D.C. We brought them to Heritage Tea House. We've allowed them to see the community and be in community together. We've also paired them up with coaches, with Jesse Ross and Camille Thomas, so they can work on those skills and work on them um, together one-on-one. -on -one. But then we also brought them in the room with torchbearers that you met a couple here today. But we wanna make sure that you knew that there was a community around you. Um, and all in all, this is just a program and it's just a six month journey. However, this is another launching point for you to be a leader within our community. Because leadership is not a position, it's a choice. Every day you get to choose to be a leader in our community. Some days you just want to take off. That's okay, but we need you to come back tomorrow. Right? Sometimes, you know, it might be, it might feel like it's too much, but you can choose to reach out to anyone in this room and realize that you can be uh, fulfilled again. Um, lastly, you know, this program for me and, and the work that we're doing um, is to really just give us a space to come together and then realize that we have enough, as, as Stella had mentioned before. Um, 
that enough part really has resonated all year with me. And one of the things that I struggle with as a leader is this whole concept of agenda, whole concept of agenda. We, I, one of the words I hope dies in 2019 yeah. is agenda. Yeah. <laughs> because it's, it's such a front loaded word that doesn't actually explain what agenda means for us. Sometimes, and what I heard was agenda means, you know, what we're gonna have a documented list of things and demands that we're gonna go take to the state legislator to get them to change and make change for our community. Something about that just didn't resonate with me all the way because that puts responsibility on someone else outside of our community to solve our problems. I think it's important that we have an agenda for that. But what about the institutions in our community? Who needs to be uplifted? Who needs to be developed? What places do we need to have and destinations on the map so that we have places to go and get filled, right? That's part of the agenda. Who are the people that we need to develop and uplift and remind them that they are a leader so that they can get the torch passed to them and those that have had the torch can pass it to someone to feel confident that the next person is gonna do what they need to do, right? That's part of the agenda. And the, other, the last part of the agenda is the culture, the culture of how we are together in community. You know, it's, it's not always X and O's. It's about how we interact with each other, how we relate to each other, how we, we see each other for who we are and that we're not one monolithic people, but we're many types of people. That's an agenda, right? So I encourage you all today to think about what your part of that agenda is. How do you come into the fold? How do you recharge while you're in the fold? How do you step out when you need to step out, but be ready to come back in? I leave you with that and I thank you. Um, here, here goes some plugs for you. So 2019, or 2020, um, our Connect events um, will begin up again January 18th. We're gonna be at TBD, but <laughs> <laughs> the monthly Connects allows you a space to come together, um, build fellowship, learn about what's happening in our community. We're gonna be talking about the census that's coming up this upcoming year. And you're gonna hear uh, from dynamic leaders such as Devonna Pittman, and others to talk about the importance of the census, but we're gonna do this every month so that we have a space to come back and reflect, connect, and then move forward together. Um, come to our website, um, www.aaltc.org for all the things that are gonna happen next year because it's about to be off the chain, y'all, I'm telling you. All right. all right, so thank you all for coming out tonight. I appreciate you. All right, thank you very much. Um, as we bring this thing to a close, I will be remiss to not acknowledge um, a group of folks who I reached out to when I initially took on the challenge of setting up a new version of the Josie R. Johnson Leadership Academy. There were a handful of alum from the Leadership Academy who sort of answered the call to go back to the drawing board, think through what leadership development looks like for each one of us individually, and how we can capitalize on creating an acceleration program for that journey. So I wanna give a shout out to my advisory committee members. I know I see Eli in the back. Woo! Shout out to you, sir. Uh, so thank you for your commitment. Thank you for your support. It's been tremendous. Um, I'm not sure what this program would be without the support of that group, so thank you. Um, for our fellows, uh, this is like, as Marcus mentioned, the launching pad, right? This is a, this is a, new, a new standard for you to, to lift off from, a new platform. Um, and as you continue on your journey, continue to be true to yourself, continue to be true to your path, um, like Anisha said, right, there's no traffic in your lane, all right? So keep handling your business. And there's a poem that says, um, uh, when you get what you want in your struggle for self and the world makes you king for a day, go to the mirror, look at yourself and see what that man has to say. For it isn't your mother, your brother or wife whose judgment upon you must pass. The person whose verdict counts most in your life is the one staring back from the glass. He's the one to please, never mind all the rest. For he's with you clear to the end, and you've passed your most dangerous and difficult test. If the man in the glass is your friend, you can fool the whole world down a pathway of years and get pats on the back as you pass. But your final reward will be heartache and tears if you've cheated the man in the glass. So y'all hold that, carry that with you. 
congratulations on all that you've done so far, and congratulations on all that you will do. Thank you, and y'all have a great evening. Thanks.